All right. Um, hello and welcome to PNP Politics and Prose Live. I'm Bernard Fajardo, a bookseller here at Politics and Prose. Uh, on behalf of the owners of the, and of the staff, I welcome all of you to this afternoon's event. Um, just a quick, a uh, few quick notes. At any time during the event, you can click on the link uh, in the chat um, to purchase copies of tonight's book on Politics and Prose's website. Your purchases will come to the store at a difficult time for small businesses across the country. And in addition to growing your own library, a book sale from Politics and Prose means that we at the store uh, are able to keep bringing you content like this, which we are so proud of. Um, you can ask the author a question by submitting it to the Q&A box, the button for which can be found near the bottom of your screen. Be sure to submit it in the Q&A and not in the chat to make sure that the author uh, sees it. So I'll waste uh, no more time getting to the main event. I am honored to introduce Kwaja Ojoa Donoso to all of you today. Uh, in 2017, she was included in the Bogota 39 list of the most promising young writers in Latin America. She is the author of the short story collections El Pes Que Aprendio a Caminar, Septima Madrugada, and Parito, and has won the Peruvian short story competitions Terminaremos El Cuento and El Cuento de las Mil Palabras. This afternoon, she will be talking about her new book, Little Bird, a collection of 30 stories that explore the strangeness of everyday life. Uh, I've read some of the short, uh, short stories in this book and amazing comes short you know, to describing it. It is really good. It comes out on July 20th and I highly encourage everyone to pre-order a copy or two of the book. Um, this afternoon, she will be talking, uh, sorry, this afternoon, she will be in conversation with a dear friend of the store and of mine, uh, Lily Meyer. Uh, Lily was once part of the events team here at uh, Politics and Prose. In fact, the day that she was leaving, I told her that her first event at Politics and Prose, I will be the host. And here we are. And I am so proud to be uh, introducing her uh, this afternoon. She is a critic whose work regularly appears on NPR and can also be found at The Atlantic, The New Yorker, and many other publications. In 2018, she won the Simonium Review Fiction uh, Contest. And if you can find a copy of the short story, I highly recommend that you read it. It is also really good. Um, so without further ado, everyone, let us welcome Claudia Ojoa Donoso and Lily Meyer. Thank you. Oh my God, Bernard, thank you. You are the best. I think everyone here knows how much I love PNP. Everybody here knows how much I loved working at PNP or is Liz and Jonathan and Bernard and Brittany and I loved working with you at PNP. Um, it's just, I'm so happy that we get to launch this book at Politics and Prose. And even though Zoom sucks, I'm really happy that Claudia and I get to do it together. Like it really is such a treat for us. I first read Baharito, which is now Little Bird, in 2015. I picked it up completely by accident. I was in Chile with my family, um, introducing my family to my Chilean host family, who I had lived with as a 16-year-old. Um, picked this book up in a random bookstore in Valparaiso. And the voice of Claudia's stories was so powerful and so compelling to me. I heard it so clearly that I immediately became obsessed, um, translated a bunch of stories having never translated seriously before and wrote her Chilean publishers a fan letter saying, you don't know who I am because I'm 24 <laughs> and I'm nobody, but I'm obsessed with this book. I want to translate it. Can you give me Claudia's contact information? Which they very kindly did. I wrote another fan letter. And the two of us, I think we FaceTimed, right? And I was probably as nervous FaceTiming Claudia then as I am Zooming with you all now. I was terrified. Me too. <laughs> so we are the same situation. <laughs> yeah. I think we're, we're the same. We have very similar personalities. And I think that's why, I think that's why we've had such a good time working on this book together. Um, it has been just like one of the great 
artistic and personal pleasures of my life, getting to translate Little Bird with Claudia and finding a home for it at Deep Vellum. We really had so much fun. Um, and so we thought that we would start out by reading, I think one of the funniest stories in the collection for you. It's very short. It's called Viaje in Spanish and a Trip in English. So Claudia is going to do the Spanish first and then I'll read it in English. So Claudia. Okay. Thank you, Lily, for your kind words. Um, I will read this story called Viaje. Um, it says, Ayer me metí a la panza de mi gato. No fue difícil. Primero tomé una ducha larga hasta que mi cuerpo absorbiese la mayor cantidad de agua posible. Una vez que el agua se rebalsaba a través de mis poros, sin secarme ni vestirme, me acosté en el jardín y me quedé varios días allí hasta secarme. Luego volví a casa y, ya seca, terminé el proceso al lado de la estufa para absorber cualquier resto de agua que pudiera quedar dentro de mí y también para sellar mis poros hasta convertirme en un pedazo de carne seca. Allí tendida, tuve que esperar un par de días hasta que mi gato empezara a sentir hambre o deseos de jugar con un pedazo de carne y me empezara a tragar. Así fue. Después de algunos días, empezó a darme mordiscos. Empezó por los ojos, que después de las entrañas son la parte más difícil de secar completamente. Solo se logra que queden como un par de pasas, mientras el cuerpo sí se vuelve carne seca, como el bacalao o el charqui, como esas orejas de chancho que vendemos en la veterinaria para que mastiquen los perros. Así. Día tras día me fue tragando. Llegar a las entrañas, blandas y no del todo secas, fue un descanso para sus mandíbulas. Cuando me tragó entera, volví a ser una en su panza. Lo que más había allí eran pelos, y cada día caían más y más pelos. Mi gato, como todos los gatos, se limpia el pelaje varias veces al día. Los pelos se me fueron pegando al cuerpo, y ya eran tantos que empecé a parecerme a un chubaca encerrado en un estómago de gato. Al fin, no me llegaban más que pelos día tras día y empecé a preocuparme por la nutrición de mi gato. ¿Quién le serviría la comida? Ya era tiempo de salir. Empecé a trepar por su garganta y llegué exactamente al lugar donde nacen los ronroneos, en la tráquea, entre los pulmones y el corazón. Me estiré hasta tocar el extremo interno de su lengua de púas y así le provoqué arcadas. Me vomitó. Los pelos que tenía pegados al cuerpo me permitieron arrastrarme sin resbalar. A los pocos días fueron cayendo y llegué con dificultad al cuarto de baño. Abrir la llave de la ducha era casi imposible. Todavía no había crecido demasiado, así que para humectarme y volver a mi tamaño normal, me arrojé a la taza del water y allí me quedé varios días, formándome nuevamente como en un, un vientre materno de losa blanca con bacterias para reformar mi sistema inmunológico y cavidades para estirarme. Cuando estaba lo suficientemente grande para no perderme por el desagüe, tiré de la cadena y todos los pelos cayeron y quedé desnuda. Por estos días sigo creciendo. Aún no voy a trabajar porque no tengo el tamaño adecuado y además todavía me quedan unos días de vacaciones. Sí, me metí a la panza de mi gato para pasar las vacaciones. Es que últimamente los aeropuertos me dan miedo y de todos modos siempre es más barato y seguro vacacionar en el estómago de un conocido. Right. In English, this story is called a trip. And for those of you who do not speak Spanish, I guarantee it is not what you imagine. Recently, I took a trip to my cat's stomach. It wasn't hard. First, I took a long shower so my body could soak up water. Once my skin was leaking, I went out to the garden without getting dressed and curled up in the sunlight to dry. When it got dark, I moved inside to finish the process in front of the stove. It sucked the moisture out of me and sealed my pores shut. I turned into a piece of dried meat. I knew I would have to wait a while for my cat to get hungry enough to eat me or bored enough to play with me. When he came over to investigate my body, the first thing he ate was my eyes, which had been very difficult to dry out. They were shriveled like raisins when the rest of me was as hard as jerky or salt cod or those pig's ears they sell at the pet store. My cat ate a bit more of me every day. 
He worked through my muscles to my intestines, which hadn't hardened completely and must have been a nice break for his jaws. Then he swallowed my skeleton and inside his stomach, I became whole. All I saw in my cat's stomach was hair. Like all cats, he cleans himself constantly. And so more hairs appeared every day. They stuck to me until it looked like he'd eaten a Chewbacca toy. But eventually the hair stopped coming and I began to worry about my poor cat's health. No one was feeding him. It was time for me to go home. I climbed up his throat, passing his lungs and heart, and stood on the place where he purrs. There, I stretched as tall as I could and managed to touch the back of his tongue. He hiccuped and puked me out. The hair stuck to my skin softened the landing. Still, it took a few days until I was ready to crawl to the bathroom. When I got there, it was too small to turn the shower on. Instead, I jumped into the toilet tank and stayed there like a fetus in a ceramic womb moving my arms and legs and soaking up the bacteria my immune system needed. Once I had grown larger than the drain, I flushed the toilet to suck the remaining hairs away. Now I'm naked and getting bigger. I'm still not ready to go to work, but I have a few more vacation days left. Yes, I took my vacation inside my cat's stomach. These days I'm frightened of airports. And besides, it's always cheaper and safer to travel with someone you know. All right. So that was Viaje, but I thought that maybe we would start by talking about the life story of Pajarito. So could you tell us when you started writing the book, where these stories came from? Uh, yes, uh, well, the book, like, uh, I must say that I, I think when we were talking before this conversation, I was thinking that... Uh, why am I, am, am I here talking with Lily? <laughs> Why my stories are now translated in English? Why am I talking uh, to an audience that I cannot see uh, in Washington DC? How is that that I'm speaking English at home <laughs> and uh, telling all these stories and yeah, and about my stories? And uh, I think a, a central thing or a very important thing for me is that I became a writer by chance. And as you were mentioning in the beginning that it was just by chance you took this book, it could be another book, but you took this one, you contact me and, and I said yes, and I was delighted and yeah, very flattered that someone wanted to, to translate my story. So all these were, uh, um, a series of, of casualties, casualidades, yes? Yeah, of luck. Yes, luck, chance, and, uh, and that is how um, Pajarito, the book, uh, also started, because I had published in Peru after I came a writer by chance, because I won a, a, a short story contest when I was quite young. Um, and I just, like my friend said, so you just did it for the money. Yes, I did it for the money. And I was, I was 16 years old and I wanted to have money to buy a sleeping bag and a tent. <laughs> so that was my motivation to send a short story. And then, well, here I am. <laughs> um, so how Pajarito became a book, it, it's almost uh, the same uh, kind of process. I had published two books in, in Peru in 2006 and 2007. And uh, my editor, uh, it happened that my editor from Peru was in Santiago de Chile and he met Andrea, uh, the editor from uh, Laurel Ediciones from Chile. And he said, uh, you have to read uh, Claudia. I have this book of her. And, and at that time, or yeah, in those years or before that, I had a web blog, uh, a blog. So it happened that Andrea had read this web blog that it was, it was written under, under a pseudonym. It was not my real name there. But she, but afterwards I said it was me. So, but she made the, the connection and said, oh, well, I, I read this uh, girl when she had a, a web blog. So after a while, so she contacted me as you contacted me and said, okay, I, I would like to make a, a collection of your stories. And I said, of course, yes. <laughs> and uh, that was how it started. And uh, after that, so it came, uh, like Bernard mentioned, uh, the Bogota 39 list that it was uh, 
like to say something that put me or put my book in on the light. So yeah, it was a bit the, the process. And the stories uh, in the book, uh, they've been written. Some stories I wrote when I was maybe 19, 18, 20, uh, before Norway, I was living in Spain. So some, some of my stories were written in, in Spain. Many of them were written in Lima and many others here in Norway. So. so do you think your writing process has changed over the years or do you still write the way that you wrote the stories in Pajarita? The process I think is the same because I get always uh, an image first or sometimes a, a sentence or some words has, has to be. And often I, I, not lately, but uh, because something has changed now when I'm, I'm writing, because I'm writing a, a novel, or at least I'm trying to. But, and, and this, this novel still doesn't have an end. But when, <laughs> when I write a short story, I, it's not that I start from the end, but I have to, to, to have in mind and, and how the story is going to end. So then I can start. Uh, and the process has been always mm, mostly the same because I, I start with an image uh, or, and I try to, to, to go deeper in that image, uh, in details, you know. So I am very aware and very fascinated by, by details. So I think it, it, it starts like that, that I focus on some details in an image and then I start writing there, there from. Well, so many of your details and so many of your images are animal related. Of course, in a trip, we get the unbelievable vacation in the cat. Um, in the title story, I don't want to spoil it, but there's a, a little bird that's very <laughs> central to the story. What draws you to writing about animals? I think this is something that came uh, when I moved to Norway, because uh, if you if you, you translated Paharit, of course, when you when you see some stories, maybe you can you can tell the difference that some were um, written or they describe cities or uh, asphalt or stones or traffic jam or a lot of people, and some others are like uh, silence and some birds and nature. So I think this thing with, with animals came when, when I moved to, to Norway. And here I live in, in Northern Norway. And uh, I remember the first time I saw a moose. You know, it's, it's, it's a huge, uh, the, 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 hu the biggest animal I have seen until that day was a horse. Well, an elephant maybe in, in, in a zoo, but like free or that close to me, it was a horse. But the moose for me was like a mythological animal. Big, it was big and it was right there 10, 10 meters from me. And it, it made, of course, an, an impression. Um, also, it's like, Everywhere I, I look here, you could see, I don't know, uh, birds or what is the name of those? Uh, uh, that Erisos, Pinswin. Oh, hedgehogs. Yes, uh, I saw those a lot. I never, I had never seen one like that before. And I even was able to, to touch one because I found one that, that was dead. And <laughs> I had to, to pick them uh, from my garden. So those sensations I had never experienced before. And I think, uh, and I'm sure it, it made an impression in my writings as it, as it made an impression in, in my everyday life as well, so. I mean, I feel like so many of your characters are just amazed by nature in some way. You know, even aside from the animal stories, there's a character who is amazed by the ocean. There's a character who's amazed by seeing 
a lawn getting mo mode. Could you talk just about like about your relationship with nature as a, a like nature beyond animals, I guess. Yeah, b before the animals, before Norway, uh, nature maybe was present in the way of body, you know, uh, blood. It, it, I, I was always, I was always afraid of blood. Uh, like I couldn't stand my, my own blood. And I never get to, to, to the point that, that could, I could faint when I had to be taking blood of me, but it was very unpleasant, very, uh, well, no one likes it, but for me, I, I could start to, to sweat, cold sweat, and I was not feeling well. And, uh, and I think I am also fascinated about, like I said, details, the microscopical level of things. I think there are, if I, like, people say so there are two kinds of people you know uh, and uh, there are I think there are two kinds of people those who look up and see big things like galaxies and planets and stars and those who look down and they want to see from ants and microscopic things and details and, and I think I am in that in that group and for for both things we we need a, a magnifier lens you know and that was uh, I was very and I am still very fascinated of those uh, small details and when this uh, virus came you know I was of course shocked and we all surely was and as we I'm, I'm sure I had the same uh, sensations that we we all had in the beginning but one thing that that uh, I will never forget is when they show the picture of the virus. You know that picture that we see, and even we have an em emoji with that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, it it could look like I don't know, like a cactus, or you know, could be a lot of things. But that was the virus, and I was very impressed by that by that <laughs> picture. You know. Besides, of course, the, the the awful and the sadness and that image in, on the TV, it wasn't a, a, a person holding a gun. It wasn't a, a, an explosion or an earthquake. It was a tiny, yeah. I don't know, thing that we could not even see. We cannot see. It's like something there that is in the air or in our bodies. So I was amazed uh, by that. I, I haven't, uh, I didn't write about the virus. I, I haven't done it. I don't know if I'm going to do it because it's been so horrible. But uh, I remember that that image that is, it's a fantasy, you know, it's like, uh, I could draw it now. Yeah. That, that impressed me. So it's, it's that sort of small or very tiny things that, uh, that caused an impression on me. And the same also in, in gestures and words and those almost invisible things uh, that uh, they, they, they make that I, I become even more curious to know what is that? Why this person is moving the hand like this all the time or moving the head like this, you know? Uh, maybe he's talking about a topic that is super important and uh, I don't know, politics or health or but then I see he's moving head or moving the hand or, and, and, and I am taken and in a way obsessed by that small detail. So that's what I focus and I start writing from, yeah, starting from those uh, small details. That's exactly what stands out to me in so many of your stories is the way that your characters zoom in on one thing, so to speak. Um, I've always loved that and I've always felt like it gives your stories kind of a dreamlike quality. Do you ever think of intentionally about making your stories feel more like dreams or more like they play by their own rules? It's not intentional, you know, but uh, I think uh, 
as, as I'm, um, I'm thinking now, uh, I like before Norway when I didn't have nature so close. I like to see a lot of documentaries about animals and small creeps and uh, nature biology. And uh, mix, if I mix those small details that we cannot see with our everyday reality, like in the story of Eloisa, for example, uh, then, it, then it gets this uh, sensation of dreaming, dreaming alike uh, story. But it's, it's not intentional. Uh, I, if I would write about my dreams, I think it would be very boring and nonsense. <laughs> but if I have these two elements, uh, like two layers, it could give, it could give that impression, I, I think. But it's, uh, I have no intention in doing it in that way. Well, I'm glad you brought up Eloisa. I mean, you know, that's one of my favorite stories, which again, I don't want to give away what the story is about, but it involves, let's just say it involves some magic with fireflies. And there are a couple other stories um, where something magical or something supernatural does happen. What appeals to you about including things that really probably can't happen in the real world, or like things that are magical like that? I will say again with the virus, you know, everything yeah. can happen. <laughs> you know, who was going to think this, this was going to happen? But uh, if, would, if, if we would have had this conversation before, uh, I would say that uh, my country and Latin America, and I think also Norway and uh, Brittany mentioned Iceland. I, I've been to Iceland too. Uh, they have stories and superstitions and, uh, you know, the black cat, my, my grandmother was very superstitious. I try not to be, but those, those thoughts are, are in my, in my mind. So this kind of, of magic in the, you know, ghosts and, uh, yeah, supernatural things. These topics are present in our Every day is conversations, you know, we, we are talking about uh, work, about every day, about our family. And ah, last time uh, my friend told me that she saw a ghost. Ah, well, I saw a ghost too. And then it starts, the, the conversation goes that way. And the same, you know, with, with animals, you know, say, I, I saw, I was crossing by and I saw a black cat. Ah, that's bad luck, bad luck, bad luck because uh, my friend also saw a black cat and blah, blah, blah. So that kind of, of magic is, is present in, in our tradition. And I think uh, it's not because we are exotic Latin Americans, because it's present in, in Norway too. Uh, they have their stories, they have uh, their superstitions and things. And I was also surprised that in Iceland, they are even more uh, superstitious than they could be in Norway, for example. So. And I want to talk a little bit about Norway, just about what is it like for you having lived in Norway for now 17 years to be writing in Spanish? Like how, how did the move change your writing and now how has so much life in another language changed your writing? Sometimes I have the same feeling, you know, I don't know what I'm doing here in Norway, <laughs> but of course I know that uh, it, it, it's been 17 years. I came when I was uh, 22, 23 years old. So uh, half of my life almost. Uh, I always, well, I, I used to say that uh, my essence is Peruvian or Latin American. But the grown up, you know, when do you start to face real problems and things, you have to really put all your responsibility in. And it has happened uh, outside, at least outside uh, Peru. So, how Norway uh, has changed uh, my stories, I think it gave me, it has given me two two points of view. Uh, the first is that I can see my own language, my own reality from Peru from distance. And it's again like, now I, I could look it with a telescope. Yeah? Uh, when 
for 20 years ago, I was living there and I had those things so close that maybe I didn't notice. And in the other hand, uh, the, I have to speak Norwegian here. Uh, I have uh, very few uh, Spanish, Spanish speaker friends, so I speak uh, Norwegian all the time. And I think uh, it does change the way, both how I think and how I write, of course, and how I see things, you know. The environment is different just to start in that way. And I try not to read what I wrote or what is published. <laughs> when I read it, when I read it now, it's like, was it me who wrote this? It's, it's a it was very strange and, and funny sensation. But uh, I think it was that person that came to Norway and, uh, to Norway and it was fascinated by those things then and there. And maybe now I am, I don't know, more aware of other things. And the language, you know, and the way how I had to communicate, how I had to talk, I think it, it, it had an influence in my way of, of writing. I think I it became more uh, laconic, brief, kind of dry maybe maybe more uh, inwards, uh, like the swimming pool story. That was a story I start writing here, yes. And then I went back and forth from Spain and I was visiting Peru and then it changed because it, it became kind of more comic or funny in the end. But the start, it was, I remember when I started to write it, it was when I couldn't speak so much Norwegian or no ma not much uh, Norwegian enough to have a conversation. And they told me, okay, if you want to socialize, go to a swimming pool. <laughs> and uh, I, of course, who is going to talk or have a conversation in a swimming pool? No one, you know, but swimming pools here and also in, in Iceland, I have to mention again, because I was there a couple of times. They are full of people. Uh, people is there, and in Iceland maybe it's a, a better way to socialize because yes. they have the head outside because water is volcanic and very warm. But here people go and swim, and they are. We were just with no words, you know, communicating just with the body, with with the water, and I think in that way both the environment and also the, the fact that I couldn't express myself in the beginning because I couldn't speak Spanish. My English is like, like this <laughs> and uh, my Norwegian was not enough. So it, it gave me or it made me go inwards. And also maybe it was at that time I realized that I don't want to, to lose my language. Mm -hmm. It was the only thing I want to, to, to hold with me, to, to yeah, to uh, afferrarme, to, to hold yeah. on to. Yes, yes. Because I start to, to think in Norwegian and it was good for my Norwegian teachers. It was good for me too. It was good for my work and for my social life. But then my Spanish uh, or my thoughts in Spanish were totally blurred and confused. And I could notice that I was speaking a very bad Spanish, a very bad Norwegian, <laughs> a very bad English. And, in, and, and I, then I said, no, I, if I'm going to write, because I was tempted and I was uh, also encouraged to maybe try to write in, in Norwegian. And I maybe tried to write some lines, but it, it was so artificial, it was so fake that I said, no, this, this is not going to happen because I'm not able to. And it is, it's, there is no point in trying. It's not, my, it's not me. And then also I realized that, okay, I, this I have to keep for me. Uh, this is my, my space, my, my word, and my words. So, uh, so yes. 
Okay, well, selfishly, I'm very glad that you didn't start <laughs> writing in Norwegian. Yeah, I'm happy you stuck with Spanish. I it, want... could, it could never happen, I, I suppose. No, it, it would never happen. Even when I would have tried really my best and yeah, doing my best, it, it always would be like fake, yes. Yeah. It wouldn't be, even when it's fiction and even when I cannot recognize myself, there is something there that says, okay, yes, it's me. You know, yeah. you see at, at, at the mirror after some years, you can see your, your face has changed, your hair, but you are still yourself. Yeah. If I was going to do it in Norwegian, it was like to have a mask or a something on it. Yeah. Weird. God, that must have felt creepy. Okay, I want to give everyone else a chance to ask you questions. So I'm just gonna ask one more. Um, I can see there are a couple of questions in the chat, but please keep asking them. Bernard will Good. come and ask them out loud. But I just, basically, I just want to make you tell the origin story of a writer's pastimes because I love, I love that story and it has a great origin. So this is a story about a successful writer who decides to quit writing and start collecting screws, which I just love. So where, <laughs> where did the screw collecting thing come from? I wrote that story when I was maybe 20 years old. Uh, I haven't, I, I was, uh, I haven't thought at the time to, to publish or I was just writing to publish like in a book, you know, I was sending some stories and trying to, to get more money if I could buy a tent or maybe a travel. <laughs> so, but at the time I was living in Spain, so I, I wasn't uh, doing so much with the, short story contest but uh, this uh, this story starts because I actually uh, found uh, screws on the streets in Lima and this is true <laughs> completely true and uh, sometimes I could I could pick them and, and look at them I never collect them but I have a friend uh, a friend of mine he is from Peru he lives in Peru he's a writer he read that this story of me and he said, how did you, same question, how was that you came to with this idea? And I said, just look at the, you know, the pavement and you will find some screws. Where they, do they come from? I don't know. So, and, and, and he did it, and, but he started to, to collect them and, and he, he's a writer too. So uh, you said, uh, there's a story as a famous writer, but he doesn't, he's not uh, so uh, happy himself. No. no. <laughs> so, and I think it's maybe, maybe I was looking at the future, not because I'm saying, oh, I'm miserable because I write, but you are never, or I am never happy with the result. I always, because I think it has to do, or, or it has very much to do with the, with the writing process. You are pursuing, you are trying or looking for something that you really don't know what is it, but you try and try and you get a final resort, result, but uh, you are never finished actually. Because I think if you feel finished, then it's like you are, I wouldn't write again. Yeah. So it's always this, uh, I can get no satisfaction with this. The song, the song came to my to my head. You know, it's like this this desire to to find something that you really don't know what is it, but you have to write it or or say it. You know, yeah. Yes. Okay. I mean, I know that feeling well. All right. Thank you for letting me ask you all of these questions. No, thank yeah. you for your questions. <laughs> No, I mean, it's great. I've never asked you some of this stuff before in all of the years that we've been talking about your story. Um, so Bernard, I'm gonna let you come back and ask everyone else's questions. I guess I will mute myself. Uh, yeah, uh, thank you very much for that very enlightening uh, conversation. Um, I'm, I'm guess I'm going to be like selfish and use my position as sort of like the moderator of this Q&A uh, Q that I'm gonna ask the first question which is my, my own question. Uh, I'm very curious about like the process of translation that transpired um, 
in the process of like translating Little Bird? Was it like collaborative where you were in constant communication with each other as you translate each story or did Lily have um, independence in like translating the story first and uh, Claudia, you just uh, gave very minimal um, notes or suggestions. I don't know if you would like to start, Lily. <laughs> I can start. I mean, I was learning how to translate the entire time. I don't think I really knew what I was doing, um, which was in a way nice because it, we could learn together. I think basically I would translate a draft and I would write all my questions and I would send the draft to Claudia. And I mean, a draft of an individual stories. And I would send maybe five stories at a time with all of these questions like, is this right? I don't think I understood this. I changed this word, is that okay? And yeah, then when you got them, you would send me notes. Yes, and one thing is, I think both surely in translating, but in writing, I have to trust my own gut. And uh, when I read uh, Lily's translation, I thought if I was born in, in the US, if I was born an English speaker, I would sound like, like her, like these words she's sending to me. So I knew then that was right, not from the point of view of uh, grammar, academical, but of course it was, but it was something else. It was, uh, I could find, uh, I could see my, myself uh, in or through her words because they were not my words any longer. And that became the thing I was chasing. Like I always wanted you to send me drafts back saying, yes, this sounds like me. And if you didn't say that, then I had <laughs> a lot more work to do. But yeah, because I guess, I guess that's yes. our process. I was muted, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm gonna go to the list of questions here. There are several. Uh, so the first one is actually from a bookseller here at Politics and Gross who also loved the book and who had fought me for the rights to write a staff pick about it. Cool. I get to introduce the book, but uh, she's going to uh, write a staff pick. Um, there are a lot of surreal elements to your stories. Uh, they seem to amplify the character's experience or convey a lack of control, but it always felt very innate to the story itself. How did this, those elements come into the writing? Were the surreal elements in your stories a conscious choice, or did you find surreal elements naturally emerging in your style? Um, again, I will, I will talk about this situation because I've been listening to this word constantly lately. This is so surreal. Coronavirus and situation and uh, elections and war and everything, it, it became uh, surreal to a, to a point that, that we cannot handle it as, uh, as a balanced human being, you know, it's, it's too much to handle. So too much to take in, too much to, to, to process and to digest. So I think now more than ever, <laughs> life has become very surreal in, in a very sh uh, short uh, uh, span of time. Uh, I remember, you know, like my mother, I see she's using a smartphone, you know, uh, but when she was, uh, uh, you know, when she was growing up, she told me uh, the story about how was the first time she got a, a TV. And my, well, my great grandmother would be, her grandmother said, you have to behave because the lady on the TV is watching you, you know, the, the, the host is watching you. So girls, you have to sit in front of the TV, sit nice and don't talk because uh, the host on TV is, is uh, watching you and you have to behave, uh, be nice. You know, those, those stories that are real, you know, that happening in my family, my, my mother tells, in this uh, period of time, uh, if we see it like in, in retrospective or with perspective, um, 
we add the situation that we are living in. It's, it's very, very surreal. We, we, we can find a lot of surreal things in our reality, if, if, it is, if I am allowed to say it in that way. So, and I also must uh, confess that I am attracted of those strange things, you know? Uh, I couldn't write about something very real, realistic, like story of the 1800th century and, uh, yeah, no, it, it wouldn't be my, my thing. So I am also very obsessed in a way of, of those uh, strange, strange things. You know? Thank you. Um, so the second question, um, Claudia, what is the story of your move uh, from Peru to Norway? It is exactly a common path. Well, I was, I could say I, I made a stop in Spain. <laughs> so it was a shorter way. Uh, I went to Spain because I went to study work and, uh, and of course I fell in love with a Norwegian boy. I came as a student here, then here I am, you know. Uh, so no, I don't, now, you know, uh, Word is distance are becoming so short, you know, you could buy a ticket. I could buy a ticket now to to, to the US and it wouldn't cost much. Um, maybe if I find something to do, if I see that, okay, maybe I could try to stay some weeks and maybe I will stay some months and then I will stay some years. It's like, uh, you never know. So it was kind of that uh, process as well that happened with my yeah, it's back on my story of how I end up in Norway. Um, this question is for Lily. Uh, Lily, when did you start translating? What made you interested in that kind of work? I started translating for completely selfish reasons. Um, when I was in, when I was doing my MFA right after college, I was living in this little town in England and I was totally convinced. I had worked really hard in high school and college to, to learn Spanish, to become as fluent as a non-native speaker can ever be. And I was just so scared that I was gonna lose my Spanish living in this little place in England. Um, and so I thought, oh, if I start to translate, I'll keep my Spanish up, I won't lose it. And maybe it'll be good for me as a fiction writer. It'll improve my craft. You know, if I write other people's sentences, it'll make my sentences better. So I didn't think I was gonna be publishing translations necessarily. Um, I was really just doing mental exercises kind of. And then, like I said earlier, when I read Pajarito, I was just so compelled that I completely reversed course, decided this was something that I needed to learn how to do seriously so that I could translate this specific book. And then along the way, I came to really love translation, love being a translator. It's such a cool, I mean, it's just such a cool thing to be. Um, being a writer or a book critic is pretty solitary. You're just alone with that feeling that Claudia was describing of never being able to get any satisfaction. And so to be able to instead translate something that I really love and work with the writer on it, it's more collaborative. It's just in a lot of ways more fun. Um, I, love, I love being a translator now and I love thinking about translation. It, is another one of those pieces of random good luck that is involved in the story of this book, I guess. Yeah, that is quite fascinating because you start with this selfish act, as you've said, but then it turned into like one of the most generous things in literature, which is translating something from a language and then giving it uh, a wider readership. So uh, thanks to you both, this is really like, you know, the provenance of this book is uh, amazing. Um, for Claudia, uh, are there any American writers that you especially admire or pay attention to? I was thinking about that question. <laughs> I, I, I was talking with, with Lily about that. And I have to mention one now, 
was thinking about Virginia Woolf, and, but Raymond Carver is one that is central to me. And again, I read a short story from, uh, of Raymond Carver where, when I was in Lima. It was a friend of mine that uh, recommended me, you, have, you like short stories, you have to read this book. I had no idea, I haven't uh, read or heard anything about him, nor his life, nor his writing. And uh, yes, it, it, it was one of, if not the central one, uh, when I started both reading in a more serious way, because I was a bit, uh, yeah, grown up. I was 18, 19, 20. And uh, yes, I, 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 this is the, the writer I would, I would mention now. But of course, uh, American writers are, you know, part as American culture, you know. I am from Peru. We, we grow up with movies, music, uh, stories, literature. Uh, and we could say, no, no, I don't want any influence from other sources. But we are influenced by, by, by those sources. And I'm happy and I'm glad to, to get those influences. Because you cannot, at least from my point of view, when you write, you cannot just focus on, on what you want to focus. You, in a way, have to just let it flow or open to what is. Because if you put some limits, uh, then it wouldn't be so real. Then it would be too artificial. It's like when you are dancing, you know, I, I like to dance, but I cannot dance. It's the same, like I would say, with writing, you know. Everybody would think, ah, oh, you are from Latin America, you can dance salsa. Well, I, I, I might dance better than an Norwegian, <laughs> but I actually don't, don't, uh, don't know the steps, but I, I like to, to, to do it. And it's the same with writing, you know, it's uh, just let it, let it flow and afterwards you see what you want to include and what you don't want to include. Uh, thank you. Um, another one for Claudia. Uh, have you read any of Lily's stories? If so, do you feel any kind of kinship with them? I am ashamed to say that no, I haven't. <laughs> no. But I, I would like to. <laughs> I can send you some. I also, I suspect one of my parents of asking that question. Okay. <laughs> uh, as the last question, um, I want to know from the both of you what you are currently reading or what are you excited to read next? You can start really. <laughs> right now I'm reading this book by Andrew Palmer called The Bachelor, which is about a writer who sort of like a writer, the one in a writer's pastimes actually, who sells a book and it goes well and then he hates his life and gets depressed and becomes incredibly obsessed with watching the show The Bachelor. Um, I think it's good, but I'm only halfway through so I can't make any promises, but so far so good. I also just read this book I really loved called Los Infamismos by um, a Mexican writer named Ana Negri, or Mexican Argentine I should say. Um, I really like that. And I actually just wrote her another one of my um, crazy fan emails to see if she has a translator yet. Um, so I'm excited about Anna Negri and I think I'm excited about The Bachelor. Uh, well, I, now I'm just, it, 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 because I read, uh, it's a bit like when, when I eat, when I am alone, I eat this and that and that and never just a meal, only a meal. And I'm thinking about that. I'm, I'm reading now, by chance, uh, uh, three Argentinian writers. One is Mariana Enriquez. Uh, she has a novel called Nuestra Parte de Noche. You have to help me, Lily, with the title. Oh, I don't, I th I don't think that book has an English title yet. Mariana Enriquez is great and her stories are in English, but I don't think anyone's translated that one. I think it might have uh, that one, but I, I am not sure. I cannot say, but 
it's a it's a story, it's a horror story about uh, the devil and a boy that was the son of the devil, and they make a road trip in Argentina. And again, uh, coming back to Argentina, uh, it, I'm reading uh, Pedro Mayral that he wrote a book called Maniobras de Evasión. I don't know how to translate it. Me neither. Uh, but this book is very interesting. It's non-fiction because it's about, uh, uh, there are short articles, I would say, uh, from a writer that describes what a writer does when he or she is not writing. <laughs> So he describes uh, situations in uh, book fairs or maybe a trip or, uh, you know, everything that is aside or beside the writing process, but yet and still it influences and, and it's important when it comes to, to write. And the other, uh, I have the book here, I would like to show it, but it's there. Uh, I just start to, to read it. Uh, it's, I'm going to show it because it's a nice book. Well, you can um, I'll say that Pedro Mayral's novel, The Woman from Uruguay, just came out in the US. Yes, uh, yeah, that is a very nice book as well. I read it for uh, some time ago. But this is from a writer called Juan Forn. I never read it before, but he died recently. Uh, and this is uh, the edition from... Uh, from Chile, and I got this book from Andrea. And the title is The Man or El Hombre Que Fue Viernes, uh, The Man That Was Friday or something like that. And they, they, this is also nonfiction, and they are like short stories or articles he wrote uh, for a newspaper in Argentina. And it's about different topics. And yeah, it's, I just started to read that. And Argentina won. The, <laughs> the, I, I, I used to watch a bit of football now and then, so, soccer. So and Argentina won the Cups, so maybe. <laughs> it's good to, to say that I'm reading Argentina. So. <laughs> All right. Uh, thank you both to Claudia and Lily for giving us this wonderful conversation uh, and this wonderful event. Um, thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, again, please, uh, you know, buy the link, uh, buy the book uh, on the link um, on the chat. It comes out on the 20th of July. They're amazing short stories, amazing translation. Um, you won't regret it. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Uh, and hope to see you soon on more uh, events and politics. Thank you. <laughs> thank you so much.